Hey everyone, I'm Tasha Shaw and I'm a real estate agent in Northern California and I'm here with Steve Peterson, broker and CEO of Infinity Investments Commercial Real Estate. What's up y'all, how you doing today? <laughs> and Steve and I, we're going to be talking to those of you that are looking to get into real estate investing. Um, maybe you're a first time homebuyer, haven't owned a property yet or you know, maybe you do own a property and now you're looking to invest you know, in an in investment property. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and that's a real big thing that we're talking about, getting your journey started in real estate investing. And it's something that we all should be looking at doing, whether you are just starting out, whether you have properties already and you're trying to take it to the next level. So that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. And the biggest thing I want to say is that it really all starts with a plan. It starts with mapping out a plan of where you want to go and beginning with the end in mind. So if you look and say, I want to retire with 20 properties, pay me 10,000 a month, or I just want to have my house paid off, whatever your end goal is in mind, start with that and then work your way backwards. All right. And then that'll, that'll help you to make some decisions along the way about what you're going to do, especially when starting out. And so cautious, what do you think are some of the things when people are just starting out, you know, what are some things that they want to know or you think that they would want guidance on as they get going? Well, I know one of the main things is financing. Um, how to purchase the property, how much money they have to come in with, um, can they use other people's money, you know, can they purchase without using their own money? Yeah. Um, and so what's your advice if yeah. I'm just starting out? Uh, what's the best way I should go? Well, okay, like we talked about mapping out a plan, right? And I think if you sit down with yourself and say, this is what I want to accomplish, right? And, and, and like I said, with the end goal in mind, and that's, that requires you to think a little deeper, a little bit longer. But then what that allows you to do is then bring it to the day, right? Br bring it to, okay, now what is our first step on how we want to get this done, mm -hmm. right? And so then when you do that, what you need to do is figure out where you are financially. Right, and you, you sit down with a real good lender, and a lot of real good lenders have credit um, repair companies or individuals that they work with that can work on your credit. And when you sit, the reason I say start with the lender is you want somebody who can tell you specifically what you need to do to qualify for a mortgage, mm -hmm. whether that is a mortgage where you move into and just one single house or townhouse, or that's a mortgage where you move into two to four units, because you can obviously you can do that as well. Mm -hmm. A lot of first time home buyers don't, understand, don't know that you can actually use the FHA uh, loan with three and a half percent down to buy a fourplex, mm -hmm. a fourplex where you can move into one of the units and rent the other ones out. Mm -hmm. So you want to start with a lender who can say, okay, let's look at your credit profile. Let's look at your taxes, your income. Let's see where you are today. And no matter where you are at today, a good lender can tell you these are the things that you need to do to work on in order to be able to qualify, right? Mm -hmm. And when, you, when you're sitting down with somebody, they're going to ask, well, what do you want? Oh, I want a house or I want a duplex or fourplex. And they can tell you where you're at. So we talked about starting with a plan and then working it back to today. What is your first step? Well, your first step is figuring out where, where you are financially. Now, once you figure that out, some of y'all might be qualified, ready to go right now, right? Some of y'all may have, like when I started out looking for my, my first home, I'd already owned investment properties. But getting a home loan is a little bit different. I use investors and partners to you know, put together uh, properties and investments and stuff like that. But buying a home for myself was different. Right, so I had to sit down with a lender that had to tell me, Steve, you ain't right. You need to do boom, 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 boom. Took me about six months to a year to establish my credit. I didn't have no credit card that established lines of credit. Had to get some stuff paid off. Had to do all that. But sitting down at that time allowed me to come in and say, this is the things that I need to do. And then start mapping out a plan and start working towards it. Right? And, it, and, I, and I, I'm going to go back to the word plan because... You gotta start with that, like with the big picture plan, bring it back to today, and then where you are today, make a plan to get to that first step. So that first investment property, that first house, whatever it is that is, that first, I got 700 credit. You gotta map that plan out, right? 
right? And then once you've got now your ducks in a row, now you can go out and start looking for a property to acquire, right? Yeah. Now you can start going to say, okay, I'm going to qualify. Now let's just say if you got your credit together, let's just say now you got a couple of dollars saved, you got an income where you're financeable. Now it comes to now I, it's time to go buy that first property. Right? Right. Within that, now you need to map out some very specific criteria. Okay, I want three bedrooms, two bathrooms. For investors, you may say, hey, I want cash flow, income producing property. Right? I may want something that I can fix up, get the rents up higher, and sell in two, three years, or fix up, get the rent higher, refinance. You now have to map out your strategy for the acquisition acquiring of that first property and that where okay now is where we took we take our personal finance situation and we we tie that into our really business strategy of going after a property and i will say this even if you buy the house especially if you buy a house today you got to put together a business strategy mm -hmm. to go in and get that house because it ain't easy you need to have the right agent that you're working with first of all but you need to be real clear communication with that agent, what you want, what you don't want, what you're willing to do to get what you want, what you're not willing to do to get what you want. Like when I'm talking about that in multiple offers, going over asking price, you need to know going in what you qualify, what your max is, and you don't want to get stretched beyond your max just trying to compete to get a property. I really think that's important because the last few years, a lot of folks have really had to go outside of themselves to make a, make a property happen. And I, I just think that you got to stay disciplined within what your, what you can do, what you can afford, what you can make happen, and not let what your cousin them did affect you. Because a lot of people see, hey, my cousin got this hot property, mm -hmm. I got to get me a property now. My friend's got a property, I got to get me a property now. Mm -hmm. And then they just go and overpay for something because that's you know what, you know they feel like they have to do something right now. I would think is it's a good thing to do something. And you should be disciplined about doing it. And that when you map out your acquisition plan, whatever it is, if you're going to be living there and paying for everything, number one, it's got to be affordable. It's got to be no more than 45 to 50% of your gross income. And really, you know, not if you buy this property and this mortgage you're paying, it can't eat you and lead you into financial despair. It is going to be a stretch, though. So I'm not telling you not to stretch, but don't over leverage yourself, don't put yourself in a bad position. Now, if it's an investment property, or a little bit of both, like a fourplex, where you live in one, the, 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 a lot of people just say, hey, I just want the property to cover itself. What I'm going to tell you is I think the property needs to be positive cash flow. Because if you have a bad month or a bad day, let's say on a, on a, on a regular day, the property is paying for itself. Man, it's just, it ain't making money, it's just paying the bills. In a bad day, that means the property, it ain't paying the bills. That means somebody, you, or whoever owns it, got to come out the pocket to pay for that. So if you budget for a property that's going to be positive cash flow on a bad day, at least the property will pay for itself. On a good day, you're paying yourself. That's the type of property that you want to be looking out for. And yes, people can make arguments, hey, I bought this property, it broke even, but it tripled it. The triple in value, right? What I'm simply saying, and that's the story of real estate, especially in California and the Bay Area. But what I'm saying to you, when it comes to investment property, you don't want to put yourself in a negative cash flow situation and then the market is stagnant for a couple of years and you're losing money the whole time. You have to look at the worst case scenario and cut that thing off and, and make decisions based on, hey, maybe I'm making $500 on this property. Not, it's not a killing, but it's positive. And is it, is it an area that can grow in value? Is it, if, like for instance, if you're living in the unit, it, now, if you're living in the unit and we're like a fourplex, right? Mm -hmm. Living up, it is okay to say the rest of these um, rents pay for the building break even because you're living there, right? And you have to, there's a cost of living everywhere you live. So when you live somewhere, you know, uh, you have to account for that cost. So if you're in a fourplex and the tenants are just paying for everything, that's cool. Versus you buy a fourplex with all the tenants in there and it's just paying for itself. 
That ain't cool because if one tenant moves out, you got a negative cash flow. And especially starting out, you want to avoid, eliminate, make sure you don't get into negative cash flow. Really, really, really important. And a lot of people just not tripping off that because if they don't get in real estate, it goes up. Let me just keep it real with y'all. It don't always go up. It mostly goes up over time. There is dips in times when it goes down and when it stays stagnant. And you have to be prepared to deal with that as you're going in. And that's real good advice. A lot of times other agents and brokers, they're just going to tell you, oh, real estate's amazing. They're not making it no more. And they were saying that in 08. I remember because I was there. You know what I mean? And it dropped dramatically. So the key for you is not be operating off fear or greed. Um, the markets operate off that. You're operating off wisdom, knowledge, a sound mind. A sound mind that creates a plan mm -hmm. that you then go out and, and execute. Whether that's you buying a condo to live with your family or whether you buying a 20-unit apartment. And that, that's the key. You know, and I hope this is helpful to you guys who are sitting here saying, trying to figure it out. Right? As we are talking about, like, well, who can we, as we start off with these content Mondays, who can we help out the most? And Carson was saying just folks that are getting started and maybe have a house and now they're trying to transition to the investment property game, mm -hmm. which I don't think I think you all should do. But you should do it smartly, wisely, with the right team in place and with the plan. That's the number one thing. Whatever your plan could be, right? Now what are your what are some of your thoughts or feedback on some of the stuff you're hearing or what you know, questions that you might have or Yeah, so you touched on two things. Um, the first one was the different process and experience from when you were buying investment properties to when you sat down to buy your own home. Yeah. And another question that I always get often is, you know, how to purchase, you know, without using your own funds. And yeah. sometimes it's even in a sense for home buyers to yeah. live in. And so you explaining like the difference in paying, you know, it's a different, it's different structure when you're paying, you know, an investment property and yeah. other people's money yeah. in your own when you're living in there, yeah. even if you're collecting rents. Um, can you kind of touch on that? Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's different, you know, and like, with, when you, especially when you're talking about, okay, acquiring properties with no money down or low money down. But first of all, like if you get an FHA loan in and of itself, that's low money down. That's only three and a half percent down plus closing costs. Low money down. Um, when you're talking about some of the creative financing strategies, the choir property without a, without your own down payment, um, that requires things like okay, sellers to carry financing. Uh, they can carry first and second deeds of trust. If you're getting a first loan from a mortgage, they can't obviously carry it first, they can carry the second. The challenge with that becomes a lot of lenders don't allow second mortgages to be carried behind their uh, financing, so you have to get a little bit creative within doing that. It becomes a lot easier to do actually for investment property than your personal residence. Mm -hmm. Your personal residence, you're able to do things like down payment assistance, mm -hmm. you're able to get gift funds from family, um, I even know people that have got gift funds from family as a gift and then they record a note after a close of escrow because they're going to kick the family's like, I'm giving you this money, but I'm going to need you to pay it back right. at some point. And the way you can do that is I'm going to give you gift funds and then you just give them a deed of, a deed of trust after the second deed of trust after the close of escrow. So that's something that can be done to structure that and make sure you can get in without any of your own funds. Here's the key to word of caution though. Because a lot of people want to buy property without, they fund, without their own funds because mm -hmm. they ain't got no money. And here's the deal. I'm keeping it real. Mm -hmm. You want to have some money somewhere when you're buying properties because things go wrong. Yeah. Well, I'm not telling you to have 100 bands in, in an account, um, but you need to have some element of reserves. And when like, you're buying a home to live in, you should have 3.5% to 5% of that home somewhere in cash even if you don't use it, even if you get the down payment assistance, right? Like even like if it's an investment property, even if you're getting a loan, the seller's carrying all the second, you don't have to come in with, with much money down or, 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 or no money down, whatever. You need to have some money. And that's it. I'm not telling you you gotta have millions or hundreds of thousands, but you need something in reserve for when that water heater busts. Mm -hmm. If the roof cave, cave in or have a problem, or just somebody don't pay their rent and you need to 
cover that mortgage payment, right? You don't want to be coming in this game completely without nothing. Now, I don't want to discourage you if you ain't got nothing to not get in the game. You know what I mean? And that's why as brokers, a lot of times I've, I've counseled people who are wanting to get in real estate investments to start with brokerage because I'm like, look, you come in and you sell real estate. First of all, you can make money. You can make quick money commissions, but you learn the business. And, I, you, and, and, and then if you want to buy investment property, as you're brokering deals, you can get paid to buy your own investment property. So you get a commission on the property you buy. You can take that commission, put it in your reserve account. You know what I mean? So that's just a way for how people can build up their cash, build up their equity, get into properties. You need to have something tucked off in case something, something pops off in the, in the deal, like, you know, pipe burst, a hot water deal, like I said before. These things happen in property, and you need to be able to be to cover them. So that being said, there's all kinds of strategies like seller carry financing, lease with options to buy, master leases with options to buy in commercial real estate or more than one unit. Also, land contracts, contracts for deeds, wraparound mortgages, which are all inclusive deeds of trust. These are all very creative um, financing ta tactics and techniques that you can use to acquire properties with either very low money down or no money down, no money of your own. Also, raising money from partners and investors. So you say you find a fourplex, that's great, that you guys are going to invest in. Maybe you have the credit, but you don't have the down payment. You can find somebody who's got the down payment. I got the credit, you got the down payment. We're partners. And you negotiate that, how that works out accordingly. But that's how you can get into it. So there's a variety of ways to get into a property with low or no money down. Mm -hmm. The key is don't, don't go up in there with no money. Right. You know, mm -hmm. get you something, some sort of a, uh, I don't even say nest egg, some sort of a reserve account. And that, look at it like this, like a, like a, a rites of passage. If you want to go into this business, you figure out a way to stack five G's up. If you ain't got no money and you're going to real estate investing, I would say find a way to make quick money, like either wholesale deals or broker deals. I actually counsel a lot of people to broker deals. In many, in many instances, brokers and agents are making more money on a sale and commission than wholesalers do, depending on the spread. You can make fat money in wholesale, but that becomes few and far between, especially in a, in a tight market like ours. Uh, there's people, I, I think, the, the wholesalers of the world make better money in, in more lenient markets. Like, for instance, in California, the Central Valley, those guys, got they're making more spreads on their wholesale. Here in the Bay Area, it's tough to wholesale because you got to work the seller down on the price and you got to get the buyer up on that price. And that spread, that gap, that's tight. The sellers want more than the properties worth. But when you're brokering deals, for sure, you can make that money. You can hustle that money up that you can use to invest, keep it in reserve. And then when you're working in the business, that's how you learn it. You know what I mean? If you're starting off and you got no money in the business, you probably don't have, don't have a lot of knowledge or experience in this. Or if you do have a lot of knowledge and experience, now it's time to apply that maybe in a different way so you can stack some money up that you can then reinvest or at least have in the sidelines if you do a creative money or you raise money type of deal. So does that kind of answer make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, and it also makes me want to add, so what if I do want a broker deal? You say mm -hmm. you coach people up? Um, yeah, well, I mean, we do We do it. I counsel people for that. And I, you know, we run a broker's affinity investments. I would love, if you're considering being an agent, you should talk to us about it. an investment agent. Talk to us about, you know, uh, uh, working on our team. But I definitely think that as you're getting into the business, the best way to learn about investments is to work get your feet to the street in the world of brokerage because first of all, we're the ones who find the deals. You know, a lot of investors find deals too, but top investors always have two or three brokers that they're rocking with to find them properties, off-market deals. That's just how it goes. So you want to know how to find those off-market deals. You want to become proficient with finding those off-market deals. And in doing so, you can make some quick money to feed your family, to stack up money, and eventually you'll know what it takes to find deals and then, hey, when you're licensed, you buy your own property, you can get paid to buy your own property. So I think you guys should take the, take us up on that and look into that <laughs> yes. more, for sure. <laughs> Definitely. Well, thank you, Steve. Um, I mean, we will be providing more information, more videos. I want to dive more into, you know, the creative financing, identifying a property, you know, all those things. Um, but thank you so much. Appreciate and it. thank you, guys. Click the link in the bio. Click the link. Thank you, guys. Have a great rest of your day.